Should be fine. Great. Great. Sorry about that, guys. So, um, first of all, who in the audience has actually done a DNA test? Okay, so just about all of you. Is there anyone who hasn't? I should have asked the question the other way around. Also, a few of you haven't. So, hopefully this might generate some interest in, um, if you're interested in finding out a bit more about DNA, how it works for genealogy, and you're about to um, pop downstairs and have a look at some of the kits. Um, but first of all, a couple of warnings about uh, DNA. One is uh, it's highly addictive. So I have tested all my family, um, all my, my, my sister and all her children, her two children, my uncles, aunts, nephews, first cousins, second cousins, anyone I can get hold of. I've also been testing all my friends as well because I ran out of family. Um, and actually, people realise now when they come and visit me that as they come through the door, they either have to give a spit sample in a tube or I, I scrape their cheek. Um, there's a, a, another warning as well. You may find some surprises from doing a DNA test. Um, and this might be quite interesting. Uh, you might find out something new about some of your cousins, something new in your tree. But you can also have some uh, not so nice surprises uh, where you've tested your sister or, or a sibling and they turn out to be a half sibling. You find out your biology, your father isn't your biological father. And uh, who knows, you might have a half sibling pop up in the database and someone was adopted out in your family. So if those, those can cause a lot of emotional trauma in families. So if that's something that you think could be a problem in the family, then really it's best not, not to test. And, and those are some of the surprises that are coming out. One quick disclaimer, I work in IT, as Morris said, I'm not a scientist, I didn't even like biology at school. Um, so my presentation is all in layman's terms, uh, based on, on things I've learned for over the last three to four years since I did my first DNA test. I have kind of lied to you because the very, very first slide has a big word on it, deoxyribonucleic acid, and that's what's, what DNA stands for. Now you can forget that straight away, you don't need to know what DNA stands for, unless you're in a pub quiz team. And I can tell you from experience, when all your friends know that you do a lot of DNA testing, and one of the questions in the quiz is what does DNA t uh, stand for, and they all look at you and you don't know, it's really embarrassing. So I now know. I have taught myself to spell it. But what DNA is, it's basically our genetic code uh, that's in all our cells. We have, uh, it, it's stored on our chromosomes. So we have, all have 23 pairs of chromosomes. We have 46 chromosomes in total. We get one set of our chromo chromosomes, so 23 come from our biological father and 23 come from our biological mother. We cannot get, a, a, apart from some very uh, interesting medical conditions, we cannot get DNA in any other way but from our, our biological parents, our mother and our father. Chromosomes 1 to 22 are called the autosomes. And you may have heard people refer to some of the DNA tests that we're doing with Ancestry, FTDNA, MyHeritage, 23andMe, as autosomal DNA tests. And that's because we're looking at the DNA on chromosomes 1 to 22, of which we have two of, one from mum, one from dad. There's two other chromosomes we have, chromosome 23, and we call those the sex chromosomes, or the gender-defining chromosomes. So if we're a girl, uh, as a female, I have two X chromosomes, like an X chromosome from my mum and an X chromosome from my dad. If I was a boy, I would have got an X chromosome from my mum and a Y chromosome from my dad. So it's the father who dictates the sex of a baby by um, either it's a, a Y chromosome or an X chromosome uh, to make that baby. If it's a Y chromosome, it's a boy. So girls have an XX chromosome 23 and boys have an XY. The types of DNA tests, I was just talking about the autosomal DNA test. This is the, really the most useful test for genealogy. It tests both maternal and paternal side. You can be either sex to have it because we're looking at that, the, the um, DNA on that, those pairs of chromosomes 1 to 22. Um, and it will look at the DNA from both your mother and your father's side. It's good for about five to six generations. So you're going to find matches that are going to help you with your genealogy for about five to six generations back. And these tests, I'm going to show you uh, where, where these tests come from, but um, FTDNA, Ancestry, 23andMe, MyHeritage and LivingDNA do autosomal DNA testing. There's a couple of other y, um, DNA tests that you can do as well. One is the Y chromosome test. So I've just told you that boys have a Y chromosome, which they get from their father. So if you're a male, you can also do a Y chromosome test. If you're a girl, you can find a boy in your family to do the Y test for you. Um, and I use my uncle's uh, Y chromosome to do some Y testing on my Rutherford side. Oh, the light's gone out. Um, 
So the Y chromosome, the y chromosome test is your father's, father's, father's line. So it's, um, it's this chart down here. And the Y chromosome is only inherited from your father if you're a man. So you're looking at the DNA that's been inherited over thousands of years on the Y chromosome line. It's what we call deep ancestry. So unlike the other test, it's not good for just five to six generations. This is something that can tell you something about your Y chromosome and your paternal line, that father's, father's, father's line, back thousands of years. There's two types of tests, what we call STR tests and SNP tests. And um, the one you might have heard about, or some of you may have done, is, a, um, for example, a Y37 test. And the 37 means it's 37 markers. So it's quite often where people start out their Y testing with a Y37 test. And then you can go on and do more tests. Now, um, FTDNA offer this test. Um, if you've done Family Finder with them and you're interested in upgrading to a Y test, you don't even need to provide another sample. They can use the same sample if it's, if it's viable. They can use the same sample and then go on and do Y testing with you if you're a male. Um, it also provides a haplogroup, and a haplogroup is just like a family name. Uh, you may have seen it in, in some of the sites where people might put RM269, um, and that's a haplogroup. And all that does is it's like a family name, and it places you somewhere on what's called a haplo tree, which is the, the tree of mankind. And uh, you can work out from your Hapla group where you fit in that tree. And if you keep testing, uh, do more, more te Y tests like big Y test, you can actually find you move further and further down the tree by finding deeper and deeper levels of your Y DNA. There's another uh, test called the mit um, mitochondrial test. <coughs> And this test, the mother's, mother's, mother's line, we've not talked about mitochondrial DNA so far, but mitochondrial DNA isn't on your chromosomes, it sits around the nucleus of the cells. Um, it is only passed down by, by mothers, so uh, passed down from women to all their children. So I have my mum's mitochondrial DNA and my son has my mitochondrial DNA. But if he, if he ever goes on to have children, I hope he doesn't have any at the moment because he's only 21, just turned 21, um, but his children will have the mitochondrial DNA of their mother. Uh, so my mitochondrial DNA will stop with my son, and so with my sister, who will have my mum's mitochondrial DNA, she's got two boys. When they have children, the, the children's mitochondrial DNA will come from their mother and not from our side. Um, anyone can do a mitochondrial DNA test because we all have mitochondrial DNA, but it will only look at the mitochondrial D DNA that's been passed down the mother's line. So a bit like the Y side, here you're looking right up the maternal line. So mother's, 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 mother. And again, it's deep ancestry testing. It will go back thousands of years. And again, it has a haplogroup, um, which is like the family name for the mitochondrial side, um, and you will know where you fit in the mitochondrial um, haplo tree. You might know about mitochondrial DNA if you know about Richard III, the king under the car park. Some of the evidence that was gathered in the DNA testing uh, that helped confirm he was Richard III was mitochondrial DNA. Um, so that's where it has, um, has had a practical use that we, we all have heard about in the last few years. Now XDNA, I talked about the fact that we had an X chromosome, so girls have an XX and boys have an XY. There's no specific XDNA test, but when you do your autosomal DNA test, the companies will also look at some of your XDNA as well. Um, not all of them show it. Um, FTDNA, 23andMe and GEDmatch will show you your X matches. Ancestry and MyHeritage will test your XDNA, but you can't see it on their site. They don't show you anyone that matches on your X chromosome. They're only looking at the autosomal DNA. If you download your file and upload to another site, you will be able to get X matches, for example, at GEDmatch and at FTDNA. But the interesting thing about this is if you're a male and you have a DNA match um, on the X chromosome, as a male, you could have only got DNA from your mother because from your father, you got a Y chromosome. So there's a couple of inheritance charts you can use here to help you. If you've got an X match and you're a boy, you can have only got DNA down this route through your mother. As a girl, you would have got it from, you'd get an X chromosome from your father, but of course he could have only got it from his mother. So these charts are really useful if you're working with X DNA. And for anyone who has done tests and has looked at X, um, X DNA, it is quite tricky, and I would suggest you need to be looking at significant amounts of X DNA before you read too much into it. Um, so which companies offer DNA testing? 
um, or FTDNA, um, which is downstairs, and they offer not just autosomal DNA testing, but also the Y DNA testing that I was talking about and the mitochondrial DNA testing. And all those three tests can all be done with, with one sample. So you can start with a test now and upgrade your sample later if that was something you were interested in. Um, the other companies, 23andMe, um, and a lot of people test at 23andMe because they also do health testing. Um, My Heritage, who hasn't been around that long, uh, they were a bit wobbly with their matching when they first came in, but certainly <coughs> there's, um, that, that's all been sorted and My Heritage uh, is doing quite well. And in fact, I find a lot of New Zealanders have tested with My Heritage. Uh, don't know why, but uh, that's something they've, they've uh, done. And um, Ancestry, who are the market leader, they say they've sold something like 12 million kits. So uh, one of the biggest databases is Ancestry. There's one more company as well, uh, based in the UK, and they've been specialising in British DNA, and they can provide a regional breakdown of your British DNA basically by, um, by county. They've been looking at other projects as well, and some of you might be aware of the Irish project. We've been gathering their reference sample for their Irish project as well. They are also, interestingly, starting to roll out cousin matching. So if you have done a test with living DNA sometime um, in the last uh, couple of years they've been around, uh, there will be cousin matching coming soon. It's probably going to be towards the end of the year, maybe early next year, but it is coming. And Living DNA have actually gone into a partnership with Find My Past now as well. So um, if you've seen the Find, uh, Find My Past page uh, and you're looking for DNA tests, they will um, they t uh, be testing with li using Living DNA. So what actually happens when you do a DNA test? Well, first of all, you get your kit. So if you've tested today or if you've tested, this is an FTDNA kit. So you get your swab and you swab the inside of the cheeks. You put it in a little tube and send it off to the lab. And in the lab, they do all the processing. So they extract the DNA um, that we're looking at on those chromosomes and, and they do all the background processing. But this is the important part of the test because it feels like you wait forever. You wait about six to eight weeks. It does feel like it goes, takes forever. But online you'll get all your results and um, all the sites will have a place you can go online to see your results where you'll see your ethnicity and you'll see all your cousin matching. Uh, this is the FTDNA um, um, dashboard and you'll see just in the last couple of days they've brought out a new chromosome um, browser here uh, which is available on their dashboard. Um, as an optional extra, all the sites let you actually download your file where your genetic code is and you can download your file and have a look at your actual DNA, your, your, um, the, the bits of it that have been tested and your genetic code. And if you download your file, you can upload that at other sites, some of them for free. And um, So how does it work? Once you've sent your uh, sample off to the lab, uh, the lab looks at these specific areas in our DNA, so they're not looking at every part of our DNA, they're just looking at parts of our DNA that we know change at every generation, and I'm going to show you how it changes in every generation in a couple of slides. Um, and if you have, uh, what they do in the background then is once they extract that small amount of DNA, and I've had it explained to me that it's kind of like, if you think of a small cupboard at the top of a very huge skyscraper, that's sort of, the, they're just taking enough DNA um, that they're looking at that changes every generation so it's useful for genealogy. And if you have long segments of your DNA in common with someone else, then you're related to them, you're a DNA match to them. Uh, there's some rules around that in terms of having enough um, DNA in common. And this is the only big word you need to learn with DNA testing, and it's centimorgans. And centimorgans you may have heard about, and that's the measure we use to work out how much DNA we have in common with someone. The more DNA we have in common with someone, the more closely we are related to them. So we're always looking to see how many centimorgans we have in common to try and work out how this person might be related to us. So I'd like to introduce you to my family. Uh, this is, these are my grandparents. Uh, so this is Jack Rutherford. Uh, Jack's um, uh, um, family are from Scotland and from Cornwall. And this is my, uh, my grandmother, Dorothy. Um, her family are EastEnders. She was actually left London as a small girl. She was Cockney and came out to New Zealand and they met in New Zealand. Um, Stan Hancock, um, my grandfather was from Warwickshire, and my grandmother here, Annie Dring, 
Um, and interesting, Annie's uh, parents were first cousins. So on, on Annie's line, when I have DNA matches, I, have, uh, I can come up with a bit of a problem sometimes because we share a lot of DNA on this line because her parents, my great-grandparents, were first cousins. But how did, how did we inherit DNA from these um, four grandparents? How did I get my DNA? This is me down here. Um, so first of all, Jack and Dorothy met and had my dad. Now, the way we inherit DNA is... Um, we get 50% from our father and 50% from our mother, and it's a random 50%. So when Jack and Dorothy had a baby, they got, uh, my dad got a random 50% of his parents. So if you think of it as kind of a colour, or some people talk about it as like a pack of cards, um, Jack dealt out 50% of his cards to my dad, he's got 50% of, of Jack's dark blue, and 50% of Dorothy's light blue. And similarly, my, my mum over here with a salmon colour and a, a green colour. Now, when mum, mum and dad met and had me, I'm, I'm the firstborn. Um, again, dad, I get a random 50% of dad's DNA. So I don't get 50% of what he got from uh, Dorothy and 50% of what he got from Jack. It gets recombined, is, is the term. It gets recombined and randomised. So I could get a little bit of light blue and a big chunk of dark blue, but I still get 50% of my dad, and I get 50% of my mum, so I get a little bit of, I, I could have got a little bit of her orange and, and a bit more of her light blue. My sister came along 17 months later, my little sister. Uh, she loves that I put her photo on here. <laughs> um, she's quite famous around the world now. She lives in New Zealand. Um, now sadly, my dad passed away several years ago, but my mum still lives in New Zealand. And um, so they made my sister, and um, she also got random 50% of Dad's DNA, so some of his light blue and some of his dark blue, and some of Mum's salmon and, and green. And you can see there that we're slightly different. So siblings will get a different DNA from their parents in different amounts, but you can see here we're exactly 50%. So we're still exactly 50% of Mum and still exactly 50% of Dad, but we have slightly different DNA. So how does that help us with our genealogy and help us find answers uh, that we've got on our family tree? So you've just met my grandparents, this is my family tree, I was born here in the 60s, um, and as I said here, Annie had first cousins. Um, on, on my dad's side, if I go up through the Rutherford side, we kind of stopped here around about Northern Ireland. Um, these Rutherfords were in Ayrshire, and then we managed to track them back to Northern Ireland, but we couldn't go any further. And then on, on my um, grandfather's side, these, this family here, they were all settlers into New Zealand, and they are a, a nightmare. So um, his grandmother was a legitimate, his uh, mother was a legitimate. We had no idea who her father was. There's nothing on any of the paperwork. And then on his mother's side, we've got this man here called Thomas Robertson that used a completely different age on every single document he filled out. <laughs> never used a middle name. And professional genealogists have never ever, over the last 40 years, have never ever been able to find out who he is. Um, so those are some of the questions that I wanted answered in my DNA uh, by doing a DNA test. And the DNA test goes back about five to six generations, as I said, on, on the autosomal. Um, so I'm looking here at trying to answer questions. I might have to get the stick out. Um, try to answer questions back to about here, my four times great-grandparents. Of course, I don't have 64 of them because these are the same people, um, because they were first cousins. So, of course, these four times great-grandparents have all had family, and those family, there's lots of siblings, all those siblings got married and had more children, and all those children had more children, and all those had children had more children, and all those children had more children. And today, so one, uh, a descendant of, of all these families um, has done a DNA test and is going to be my DNA match. Um, and that's what I'm looking for, my DNA matches that are descended from my same ancestors. Now, that's me. I can go back about five to six generations. But I've also tested my mum, so she can go back five to six generations, which gives me another layer back to go to start solving some of my brick walls and confirming some of my tree. Now, interestingly, you may have seen this question mark turn up that wasn't there originally, and that's because DNA can bring in some surprises and mysteries. And we're pretty sure that the person we thought belonged in this pink box here isn't the person we thought she was. And that's because we're getting some very unusual DNA matches back on this branch. 
um, that are pointing to a different family and possibly a family that they married into. And of course, you can't get DNA by marrying into a family. You can only get it by, from biological parents. So uh, we're starting to second guess who she might be. And interestingly, we could never find a birth certificate for her. So um, we're um, starting to have a look at that line now. And then similarly with my dad, as I told you, my dad sadly passed away several years ago. Um, but he's got five brothers. So um, because I can't test dad, I have tested four of his five brothers. The other one hasn't been very well. But he actually has a DNA uh, test sitting in his kitchen at the moment somewhere in New Zealand. Um, on his farm, and I'm hoping that he's spitting today. Um, and and, I'm really <laughs> and uh, that will give me all five of Dad's brothers in the database. Dad didn't have any sisters, um, he only had five brothers. So, um, so I have Dad's siblings, and as I told you, siblings all get slightly different DNA, right? So as it recombines, slightly different colours. Um, so um, having all Dad's brothers has given me a great pool of matches to, to work back on, on Dad's side. Now, because we got back to Northern Ireland here, uh, what I've done is one of my uncles did a, a big Y test. We did it, started off with Y37 and I upgraded over time to big Y. Um, and we've been able to work out, family law always told us that we were Scottish from the Scottish borders. So we expected we were border reavers, um, probably from around Jedborough area, um, south of um, Edinburgh. And but I couldn't find anything in the paperwork. We could only get back to Belfast. So my working high but I've done this big Y test and I've matched um, with a whole lot of other Rutherfords that are all for, from the borders and we're all quite close matching. So I'm pretty sure we really were from the borders, our stories were right. There is no paperwork here back in the 1600s, 1700s. So my working hypothesis is that for some reason my branch of the Rutherfords were in the Ulster plantation and that's why they were in Belfast and they've gone back to Ayrshire in the famine years and from Ayrshire they've come out to, um, out to New Zealand. So after you've done your DNA test, the first thing you usually want to see when you get your results back is your ethnicity. And you've seen the ads, do a DNA test and find out if you're a Viking, because everyone wants to know if they're a Viking, right? Um, and it makes quite entertaining conversation when you're having a beer with your friends at the pub. Guess what? I'm a Viking. Um, so these are, this is my ethnicity. Uh, I first tested Ancestry. I've now tested all the other companies, and I've uploaded my file lots of different places. And my ethnicity is all over the place. So pretty much um, FTDNA and Ancestry show me as uh, British and British, Scottish, Irish. Um, but then as I come down, I've done some other tests. Um, this is a, a Chinese site, actually, so they think I'm Chinese. Um, Living DNA did a great job of working out the counties that I came from uh, with all their British uh, work that they've been doing. Uh, but they snuck in 10% in Tuscany. So they say I'm 10% Italian, um, that, that hasn't come up anywhere else. Somewhere over here they think I'm from Finland. Um, so it's pretty, you know, I'm pretty much all over the place. So how, so how do they find your ethnicity from a DNA test? And why is it different every time you upload it somewhere? And why is it different uh, when you do a different test? And can you really trust anything from the DNA companies when ethnicity looks so different? Well, the way they do it is they estimate it by comparing you to a living group of people, which they call their population, uh, their reference group, um, or their uh, reference set. And, and so Ancestry at the moment, for example, been comparing you to 3,000 other people in their reference um, database. And those 3,000 people were people that met some sort of criteria. Living DNA, for example, they, when they're uh, trying to find reference people for their projects, they ask you to have a grand grandparents born within about 50 kilometres of each other. Um, so all the companies will have specific reasons of how they get you to be a reference person for them. As I said, Ancestry have been working with about 3,000 people. And actually, if those 3,000 people don't represent an area of the world where you've got some ancestry, that's never going to turn up in your ethnicity results. Every company uses a different set of people. And that's why you get different results. Now, Ancestry, oh, I'll come to that. So a lot of people say to me, well, if, if that's the case, Donna, how do I know which one's accurate? Where do I test to get my most accurate, um, accurate uh, ethnicity results? And this is my standard answer. It's the one you like the best. And I can't think of any better answer to that question. If you're happy with one of the ethnicity estimates and it reflects your family tree, then run with that one. 
if one of the tests has some Scandinavian and you'd like to say that's Viking DNA, bear in mind no one's dug up any Vikings to match you with. There's no Vikings in the reference set. Um, but, yeah, sure enough, tell, you, tell everyone that you're a Viking. But, but really, there is no better science than that at the moment. However, the companies are continuing to try and tweak the ethnicity because they realise that's a great marketing tool. Do a DNA test and find out where you come from. And ancestry, anyone who's got an ancestry test, uh, you would have seen your ethnicity updated in the last few weeks. And what they've done is they've changed their, tweaked their algorithms a bit, some of the <coughs> mathematics and, and clever stuff behind all the, match, uh, behind all the um, calculations. But they've also increased their reference panel from 3,000 people to 16,000 people. So they're now comparing your DNA to 16,000 people. And um, they believe that's becoming more accurate and being able <coughs> to give you a better, uh, better answer on your ethnicity. And um, after that, I was 5% Irish and Scottish in three, three, uh, probably four weeks ago. And now I'm 36% Irish, um, Irish and Scottish. So... <laughs> so that could, uh, that could mean I have to start drinking a little bit more Guinness, um, which is fine by me, by the way. Um, I have one other region. You can see over here I had seven other regions. I had tiny bits of Finland, Iberia, Peninsula, Scandinavian, all sorts of things. And that, they've removed a lot of that. I have one other region, and it's actually Swedish. And so that's a whole new country for me. I don't have Swedish anywhere else. So I'm going to start shopping at Ikea a little more often. <laughs> Um, and, and so, as I say, so, uh, some of the companies are trying to roll out tools where you can use your ethnicity. Uh, this is the family tree uh, DNA, FTDNA is my origins, this is their ethnicity. And they've got tools like you can plot where the um, most, uh, the most, uh, the furthest away ancestor is the, the oldest ancestor that your matches say they have. So you can see, interestingly, at FTDNA, my matches say that their oldest ancestors come from kind of this region as well, so, so UK, Ireland. Um, now, can ethnicity help you with genealogy? So I basically said to you, take it a little bit with a grain of salt. Um, it just depends which company you've tested, what, what sort of result you've got. But this is an example I actually had um, probably just a few months ago now. Jennifer is my fourth cousin. And Jennifer came to me and she wanted to um, see if I could help her find who her unknown father was. She was adopted by her stepfather. And I knew, because she matched my dad's first cousin, I knew she came from my Rutherford and Robert's side of the family. And I pretty much knew, because of where she lived and what she'd been able to tell me, she wasn't from the Rutherford side, and I was pretty sure she was from the Robert side. So she actually had her birth certificate, and she sent me over her birth certificate, which did, which did have the name of her father on it, so I had something to go on. So I did some sleuthing. I was looking at uh, the, the, the father who was said to have come from New Zealand, uh, so I was looking at electoral rolls in New Zealand. Of course, I know my way around the, the New Zealand record, so it was relatively easy. Um, tracked down who I thought was um, the tree that Jennifer came, to, came from, and I thought these were her great-grandparents. So George Roberts, who is um, from my side of the family, married a lady called Frances Nieschowski in my hometown in, in New Zealand. Now, I thought to myself, well, that's kind of interesting because Francis comes from a very well-known Polish family in my hometown in, in New Zealand, and there's a lot of documentation about those early Polish settlers. Now, I know that we don't have any East European ethnicity in the rest of our family, so I thought, I wonder if there's a clue by looking at Jennifer's ethnicity would at least give me some clues that I was on the right track. It would tell me I was on completely the wrong track. So I went back and I had a look at Jennifer's ethnicity, and sure enough, she had some East European ethnicity. So whilst that didn't confirm for me I was on the right track, it was another clue that I was heading in the right direction with the Roberts family. And after a bit more sleuthing and finding um, details and putting all the family tree together, from about probably about three hours since she'd sent me the birth certificate, I was actually able to send her back a photo of her great grandfather, this guy here, Samson, and my great -grandf second great grandfather, John. Um, George is the son of Samson, and I'm descended from John. And I was able to send her back a photo of her um, two times great grandparents, uh, my grandfather standing next to my two times great grandfather. Great looking guys, by the way. <laughs> I love his feet. Look, look at these. Sh look at these shoes. So tall. <laughs> and, and, and interesting. I've got some photos of George. I sent her as well, and George is also very tall. 
so how can DNA help with our genealogy? So that was just an example of where, where I used ethnicity as a little bit of a clue. Um, but the other thing it does, it's comparing you, the DNA is comparing you to everyone else in the database. And that's where you get your DNA matches. And this is the real power of, of uh, doing a DNA test for genealogy. So you compare to everyone else in the, in the database, and the databases are growing all the time. When I tested at Ancestry early 2015, I had 32 fourth cousins and closer. Uh, this morning I've got 273. So in three and a bit years, three and a half years, that's how, how fast the, the databases have been growing. And what it does is not only gives you all your cousin matches, it tells you um, how much DNA you have in common with them. And this is the big word I was telling you about before, centimorgans. It will tell you how many centimorgans you share with someone, which helps you work out how they can be related to you. But will you match all your cousins? Well, you, um, there's never been a case so far where a second cousin hasn't, um, hasn't been a DNA match. So if you test your second cousin and they don't appear in your match list, then you have a mystery to solve. So, um, you, so second cousins you should match. Once you get to third cousins, there's probably 10% of them are going to drop off and they're not going to match you. And that's because that's, that's that the, um, the dilution of DNA at every step. Remember my grandparents and the light blue, dark blue. At every generation, we were getting 50% of each of our parents. And so it can get diluted where your third cousins aren't going to have enough of that DNA come down their branches. At fourth cousins, probably round about 50% of them aren't going to match you, and then it really drops off with fifth, fifth and sixth cousins, and that's why we say ultrasomal DNA testing is good for about five to six generations, because you're really not going to share enough, enough DNA to make any sort of um, uh, uh, ideas about whether they fit in your family or not after that. And so there are charts that explain um, how many centimorgans you share with someone. So a parent is about 3,500 cent or 3,400 centimorgans. Um, a sibling is around about 2,500 centimorgans. And then, then interestingly, if you match someone at 1,700 centimorgans, that actually could be your aunt or your uncle, but it also could be your half-sibling. So once you start getting further down the, um, down the number of centimorgans you share with someone, a lot more relationships come into play. Now, brilliantly, you don't have to remember this chart because there's a fantastic website uh, that uh, Johnny Pill runs called uh, dnapainter.com, and on the tools section of his site, there is a fantastic cool tool called the Shared CM Project. It's interactive, so it means you can go and put in an amount of um, DNA, so however many centimorgans you match with someone, and it will give you an idea of what the relationship should be. If you bookmark anything, bookmark the site, because you need to use that tool all the time. Do not take the cousin category at the test site for granted. So just because they tell you it's a third cousin, they don't know. Uh, there's so many other relationships. We have double cousins, we have three-quarter siblings, we have half-siblings, we have half-two cousins three times removed. We have so many different relationships, and all those categories are not available at the site. So the first thing you need to do is have a look and see how many centimorgans you match with someone. And on there I list all the different um, companies and how to find the centimorgan amount. Go and put it in the shared CM tool and it will give you an idea of all the different relationships you might be looking for. But just because the site tells you you've matched with a third cousin, don't take for granted it's a third cousin. So what can I do with my matches? Well, I can find biological family, and you'll hear about adoptees testing, donor conceived people testing, people looking for biological family. I found, I found who um, Jennifer's father was, for example, because she was a DNA match to me, and I could work out who she had matches and how she fitted in with my tree. You can also contact your newly found cousins. I mean, you don't know um, this, this lady over here in pink, she, she may be sitting somewhere in another country and have your family Bible sitting in a bottom drawer because it got passed down her side of the family and not down your side of the family. And this is really interesting for me because my family all immigrated to New Zealand and of course they didn't take a lot of family Bibles and things for, with them. So by finding some of my biological cousins that are back here in, in um, the UK and Ireland um, and Scotland, um, I'm finding that they've got documentation and information and things that have been handed down the family that of course never made it to New Zealand. 
Um, one thing to remember is DNA testing doesn't replace traditional genealogy. In fact, I have spent more time doing traditional de uh, genealogy since I did a DNA test because I'm forever building family trees to find out where my, where, my, um, where my matches fit with me. So I actually do a lot more genealogy now than I've probably done the rest of my life put together. And how does that work? Well, how do we go about confirming a paper trial with a, um, with a DNA match? So this is one of my ancestors. This is my, my third great-grandmother. Now, her name is Elizabeth Smith. And I don't know if any of the genealogists want to take a stab at how many Elizabeth Smiths lived in Lincolnshire in the 1800s. Um, so Elizabeth Smith was on my list of things to do on a very rainy day, and, and I never really did much research into her family. I, I knew all about her family. She came across to New Zealand in 1875 with her husband and, and some of her children. And then I, uh, this is very early days, one of my first DNA matches was uh, someone called KP who lived in the US. Now KP had someone called Diana Smith in her tree, and I could tell she had a very good tree. Um, she was American, all her branches were, were fully fleshed out, lots of documents, all very well sourced, except for one part of her tree uh, where Diana Smith apparently just came from England. And I found this with some of my American matches, it's very easy to spot where you might fit into their tree because when it gets to England, they're not as confident with the records and know their way around the records as some of us do in, in the UK and Ireland. We know where to go and get the, the records from. So I easily spotted that this could be something interesting. Was Di Diana Smith related to Elizabeth Smith? And she had the same birth date in for her. And I, you know, I, I typically thought she must be wrong. She's got the wrong person. Um, so what I thought I'd do is start to have a look at the records where there was an Elizabeth and a Diana. And it was spelled quite unusually as unusual with the H. And in the records, I did find an Elizabeth Smith and a Diana Smith living together with their parents. They were the same age, and I started to find some more sources for them. So I found their baptism. I also found a poor law removal. Their father died, and they got you know, moved from the parish back to their original parish, uh, which was common in the time. Um, and again, the girls were both uh, down with the same birth date, the same ages. And we've come to the conclusion that Elizabeth and Diana were twins. Now, that was something that none of us knew. Uh, you know, Elizabeth Smith, we've done no research on her. And in fact, this story was what made my mum test, because my mum said, well, I'm not doing a DNA test. I don't want to have anything to do with that. I, and I started to tell us, guess, guess what? I found out, you know, Elizabeth Smith, Betsy, Betsy Longstaff, she was called. She married Tom Longstaff, when she said, Betsy Longstaff was a twin. Now, Betsy actually had twins as well. She had some more children out in New Zealand. Her last two boys were, were twins, Isaac and Charles, Charles. So my mother found that really interesting. She's like, well, why hasn't my DNA kit arrived? You know, why haven't you sent me one? So, so that story actually really encouraged mum to test and also my sister to test as well. And it was one of the first things I confirmed in my tree from a DNA match that was actually in the US that I had no clue that that family had gone to the US at all. Uh, how am I doing for time? Oh, good. I'm doing good. I really want to leave some time for questions for you. So um, I've talked about, you know, how to, you know, using your matches to try and confirm your tree. And, and this slide is really just consolidating some of the things that we need to know about when we're using our DNA matches for, for genealogy. So first thing is what we want to try and do is find a tree, see if our, any of our matches have a, have a tree attached to their DNA. Have a look at their profile at FTDNA and Family Finder. All your matches will have their email address in there. And even if they're not answering their email, you can go and Google search their email address and you might find out they have a website or somewhere else they store their tree. Now, interesting, I had a match turn up the other day. No link tree, no information, couldn't find anything else. Was looking at the, in the DNA page. I thought, I'll just have a quick look at his profile, but that probably won't help me. I opened up his profile and he'd written a little bio and he'd listed his parents, his grandparents, um, the, the address of the website where his, his family tree was. So by going that extra step and looking at his profile, I found out if, well, everything I needed to know about him. Um, also look at the shared matches, um, for those of you who have tested, you know, your match list isn't just a list of, of DNA matches, every single one of those DNA matches probably matches one or two or more of the other people in your list as well. And actually, if you deal with your matches as a group of matches rather than just one match at a time, um, you might find out a lot more. One person, one match might not have a family tree, but they're matching five other people, and three of those all have a tree that go back to the same common ancestor. Um, the Sheds uh, Centimorgans. Uh, Centimorgans is always written as a little C and a capital M. 
Don't take the cousin category uh, for granted on the websites. Always go and look on uh, the DNA Painter tools in the Shared CM project and get a better idea of what the relationships might be. Contact the match. I like to keep it really simple when I contact a match. Um, I typically don't send them an email and say, hi, I'm your cousin, how do we match? Because I realise that, and I have lots of messages like that from some of my matches, and I have access to, I don't know, 200 kids. I have no clue who they're matching with. <laughs> this is one of my kids or one of my friend's kids. Got no idea. Um, so if you contact a match, make sure you give them some information about you. And, and all I really ask them is if they know their grandparents. And a lot of people now are testing because they got a DNA kit for Christmas. It was under the Christmas tree. They unwrapped it. They spat in the tube. They found out they were a Viking. They were really happy. And they're never going to look at it again. So those people aren't going to write back to you. Um, those people, you need to do some sleuthing to find out who they are. And I, and I, so that's my last uh, step on this page is sleuthing. And I mean sleuthing, not stalking. So this, this for me is actually quite important. It's something we've been talking about a lot during this conference is the ethics and um, things we and privacy rights of some of people who do DNA tests. Now, ultimately, every single test taker has the right to privacy. And when I say privacy, what privacy means to me might be different than what privacy means to, to, to you guys. And it, and it might be different amongst all of us. There is no right or wrong in terms of how you feel about privacy. The way you feel about privacy for you is correct for you. And don't let anyone tell you that you should do things in a different way because that's the way they feel about privacy. Privacy, it's really important that you follow um, your own feelings about privacy. So ultimately, you shouldn't take a test if you don't want people to identify you. People can be identified by DNA tests, and actually to be aware can also be identified from your family doing DNA tests as well. Um, so when you're doing some sleuthing to try and work out who one of your matches are, and then you happen to find out where they live or their phone number, don't go around there and stop outside their gate and take photos of them to see if they, you know, who they look like in your tree. Um, so I, d I have in fun said, oh, I'm busy stalking a DNA match, and someone got quite upset with me by, by saying that, but actually, um, I, I know this is really serious for me. We're talking about sleuthing. We're talking about using public records. I use Facebook, Google, newspapers, um, sites, electoral rolls, um, but that's not stalking. That's using um, information that, that's freely available. I haven't, um, I haven't hacked into anyone's account, and I don't go around to their house, and I don't ring them up at work. Oh, but sadly, some people do that. Now, the other thing with DNA testing, and nothing, I love this. So, if you're walking along a country road and you hear hoof beats behind you, so, so say you're going out next weekend and you're walking along country road and you hear clip, clop, clip, clop, clip, clop. What do you think you're going to see when you turn around behind you? What are you expecting to see? <laughs> Someone knows this, right? So you're expecting to probably see some horses behind you. You're not really expecting to turn around and see a whole load, load of zebras following you down the country road. Perhaps an island, I don't know. Is it common to see zebras? Um, but this is one of my favourite quotes. Where you hear hoof beats, think of horses, not zebras. And it's really important when you're doing DNA testing, you're looking at your matches, that you're actually making the right, you know, you're, you're looking at the right information and you're interpreting it cor correctly. And I have seen people who have uploaded their DNA file to GEDmatch and suddenly been ringing their parents saying, why the hell didn't you tell me I had an identical twin and did you separate us at birth and what a bad parent you are? Where actually they just forgot that they uploaded their file the previous week and so they're actually just in GEDmatch twice and they're not really identical twin. <laughs> I've also seen people, if, if you know GEDmatch, there's a little owl as you go across the page and you can click on that and people sort of look at it and don't know what it is and click it. And if they've happened, it, what it does is list out the matches of the match that you've clicked it on. Now, if that match happens to have a parent in the database, you know, you've just clicked this button, you don't really know what it was, and suddenly you've seen a parent along the top line and you're suddenly getting concerned because that's not the parent that you know. Um, and I have had people absolutely worried that their parent, their, biologi their biological parent was someone different than who they thought it was because they've clicked the L button at GEDmatch. Um, so it's, it's really important that, you know, lots of people say DNA doesn't lie, um, but correctly inter interpreting DNA can be quite problematic. So, for example, that the person who thought she had an identical twin, she just interpreted that wrong. So if she said, well, I must have an uh, uh, identical twin because DNA doesn't lie, she'd just forgotten that she'd uploaded her file a few weeks back. The other thing when you're working with your DNA matches, beware of confirmation bias, and I've definitely fallen into this trap. 
Um, I thought I had found my Thomas Robertson, who is a very, he's the man who uses a different age on every single document, never uses a middle name, came from Perthshire out, well, we, we thought came from St Andrews in Scotland out to New Zealand, um, but yeah, couldn't, couldn't ever work out who he was, professional genealogists couldn't work out who he was. Now I thought I had found him because I've got a whole lot of DNA matches that all go to, back to a Robertson family in Perthshire. And I'm like, right, I finally I've nabbed him. He must be of this family. And I did a bit of research and I found that they definitely did have a Thomas Robertson, the oldest son, and he'd completely seemed to have disappeared off the records. So I thought, oh, I've got him. He didn't disappear off the records. He went to New Zealand. This is Thomas Robertson. And I took it down and I showed my uncle. My uncle lives down in Dorset. And I went down and I went through it and I said, what do you think? He goes, well, have you tried to find Thomas Robertson's death certificate? I'm like, yeah, yeah, of course I did that. Of course I did that. And I always had this little sort of uh, uh, nagging doubt that did I really try hard enough to find Thomas Robertson's death certificate to rule out that he really was the right one. And it was only about two weeks later and some man emailed me and said, I just want to know, why do you have my Thomas Robertson in your tree? He died quite young. He didn't go to New Zealand. And he actually sent me the death certificate. So I fell into my own track of confirmation bias. I really wanted this Thomas Robertson to be the, the one who went to New Zealand. So Thomas is now a big mystery for me again. So you've got your DNA test, um, we've looked at ethnicity, so how that might be useful if we're, if we're aware of, of what ethnicity is all about. We've looked at using DNA matches to confirm our family tree, find biological family. But these are just some of the things to remember along the way. So spend time researching. You're not going to do a DNA test and suddenly find a whole family tree. Um, sitting behind it, uh, you need to spend time researching and some of that time can be a long time and some, some, sometimes it's going to take days, months, even years to, co to confirm parts of your tree. Use creative ways to identify your matches but remember it's about sleuthing not stalking and as you go on you might start wanting to learn about some more advanced matching tools and some of our other talks during this conference have been used about using advanced tools like um, chromosome browsers, using triangulation, using DNA painter, lots of different things out there that can help you with your research. Surnames can be less important than locations because Lim and women, they change their surnames every generation by marrying people. So you don't always know if when you're finding a DNA match. Lots of people say, um, well, I've got my DNA match list. I can't see my surname in it. And I can tell you that um, the only person who has Rutherford in their surname match is my mum. And my mum's not a Rutherford. I'm the Rutherford, and it should be on my dad's side. And that's because it's a very small family, and there's no male Rutherfords in my autosomal um, match list. And the Rutherford that happens to be in my mum's match list, we list on a different side, and we're not related to his Rutherford at all. But actually, if I go searching for Rutherfords, I might pick up this man, but he matches me on my maternal side and isn't um, matching me on my Rutherford side at all. Collaboration, it's really useful to work for you, with your matches. So, uh, for example, Jennifer, when she wanted to know who her biological father was, uh, we exchanged a few emails and, and, um, and I helped her out by sending her some photos and information about her tree. And some of the people I've met, um, some of my biological family, or fourth, third, fourth cousins in the UK, have helped me out by telling me a little bit more about some of the family that stayed behind when my family went to New Zealand. Upload your files to other sites, so if you've done an ancestry test, you can upload to FTDNA, MyHeritage, uh, GEDmatch, LivingDNA at the moment as well. Uh, a little tip, if you want to upload to MyHeritage, if you've got a, a test from FTDNA, uh, 23andMe they're taking now, and Ancestry, upload before the 1st of December. From the 1st of December, my heritage are going to charge for using some of the tools on their site, but if you've already uploaded, it will stay free for you. So um, if you've got a file to upload for my heritage, get it done before the 1st of December. Always remember to look at shared matches. Working with a cluster of matches can be a lot easier than working with just one match in isolation. And look at who else they match. For example, Jennifer. When I looked at Jennifer's um, match, I could see she matched my dad's paternal cousin, so I immediately knew she was on my Rutherford Roberts line. Target test people. If you're looking for an answer in your family tree, work out what, who you need to test to get the answer that you want and go hunting down a cousin that can help you with that. Um, also think about what if other tests that might help you. So for example, my Rutherfords, yeah, we've been able to confirm we come from Scotland only because we did the big Y test and did Y DNA testing. We couldn't have found that from autosomal DNA. 
um, and test more relatives, and especially older generations. You saw in my in my chart in my with my family the light blue, dark blue, uh, salmon colour, lime green colour. Um, that that DNA gets diluted at every generation. So always test an older generation where you can. Um, one, because they may not be around much longer and we will lose that opportunity, but also their DNA is less diluted. And if it's your parent, you only have 50% of their DNA. So by testing them, you've got 100% of their DNA. Uh, so test that older generation as soon as you can. Some of my success stories, and we talked about a couple of things along the way. Um, I'm actually working on confirming my great-grandmother's illegitimate. You saw that in my tree. I had uh, my grandfather's uh, mother was born illegitimate. We pretty much narrowed down who that is, but he comes from a settler family and everyone's interrelated. So every time I get a DNA match, I have to go through the tree to see if they're not related to me about five other different ways. So that's proven a bit of a nightmare. Found out my um, three times great-grandmother, Betsy Longstaff, you met her earlier, found out she was a twin. And I actually have in here that I confirmed who Thomas Robertson was, and I've crossed that out. And that's to remind people that you could have, um, you could think you've found somebody, and you might have it right, and a piece of evidence will come along that completely rules it out. Um, you should always be trying to disprove any of your theories. So if you think you've got something right, try and disprove it. I found out some of my Dorset ancestors <laughs> I went to Newfoundland. Uh, mine, mine went to New Zealand and the siblings went to Newfoundland and I actually wonder if they kind of went down the docks to get on the ship and someone said, we're going somewhere starting with new and one lot got on a ship for New Zealand and another ship got on a ship for Newfoundland. But that was something really interesting. I have a lot of family, um, fourth, fourth, fifth cousins that are in Newfoundland so that's on my bucket list of places to go and visit and I've been told it's really nice so really looking forward to that. Um, and I sold for Jennifer's unknown father, I've told you about, um, and she was one of my Rob, uh, Robert's family. And I found fourth cousins all over the world. I mean, one of them's in Alaska. I mean, what an amazing place. I've got people in Texas. I've got DNA matches all around the world. And, and perhaps that's because our family like travelling. You know, my, my family have all arrived in, in um, New Zealand, and here am I back living in, in the UK. Um, I think we, I just come from a, a group of people that are travelling around the world. I've also worked on a, a founding case um, and uh, some adoptee cases. Uh, we were found biological uh, family for foundlings and adoptees, which is incredibly rewarding, but very emotional and traumatic. And if you're doing that with some of your matches, just be aware that it is a very emotional and traumatic time, not just for the DNA match, but also for the biological parent that you find. So always be kind um, to people if you're working in that area and think about some of the ethics involved. Um, and obviously I still have many, many more mysteries to uncover. Um, I'm sure every time you get a DNA match, it's a, they're, they're a mystery anyway, trying to figure out who they are. Um, and I'm sure there's lots more stories I'm going to find. Uh, this is some places you can get some help. The first one is the ISOG wiki. Um, we're all from ISOG, anyone can join ISOG, it's fantastic. The wiki is absolutely amazing. Anything you need to know about um, DNA you'll find on the wiki uh, with lots of links out to blogs, sites, tools and so on. And my Facebook group, I think I've got some people here today who belong to my Facebook group. Um, there's about five, 6,000 of us. We concentrate mainly on, on UK. Um, we, we do have some Irish people in there as well. We have some US people. And we kind of concentrate um, around UK and Ireland for, for helping people. Um, because it is quite different. People in the US have been testing for a lot longer and have some different, um, you know, different ways of, of um, finding their matches. And lots of YouTube videos. So this one will go up on Genetic Genealogy Island, thanks to Morris. Um, some amazing videos up there. And in fact, that's how I learned how to deal with my DNA, was watching Morris speak um, on a DNA for Beginners talk. So everything I know, I, I learned from Morris. Uh, testing company. So if that's, yeah, that's just to get me a disclaimer in case I said something wrong, right? Um, and the testing companies themselves, so, I mean, this is from Family Tree DNA, um, they actually have a, a support site um, about DNA basics and beginner's guide to gene genealogy. So don't forget to check the test site um, for help and support as well. And that's it. Thank you, Donna. <laughs> Fabulous. Packed full of information. Um, how many people are in the DNA Help for Genealogy Facebook group? There's a few people. It's actually a really, really good place to go and find an answer. So if you have any kind of questions, certainly I recommend joining that group because you'll probably get an answer within about five or ten minutes of actually posting it. Um, not today. <laughs> <laughs> not necessarily from you, but it could be from anybody yeah, else in the group. There's lots of really good people in there now that have got some really good, helpful advice. Yeah, yeah cool. it's brilliant.
Great. Well, Don is going to be around for the rest of the day, so if anybody has any questions, then um, please do not hesitate to approach Donna or anybody else downstairs on the Family Tree DNA stand. Um, and uh, we'll be having the next uh, t a talk from Cahill Mahogun in about uh, f five minutes' time, three to five minutes' time. Uh, so uh, thank you very much again to Donna Rutherford. Thank you. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Maybe we can go downstairs to discuss it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, thank you.